Okay, that's it. Okay, uh, so I'll start sharing my screen. Let's, uh... Uh, can everyone see this? Yeah, we can. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you to Alma Dana and uh, London Alt Photo for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, it's a great honor to present alongside Liz, uh, whose work I first uh, saw at Photo London a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, uh, really resonated with the first time I saw it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's great to be able to speak with Liz today. Um, so yeah, like I said, my work explores themes of the sublime and uncanny. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna share uh, from old and more recent projects and how those projects came together and the ideas behind them. Uh, so my first project is called Universal Sympathy. Uh, so this project uh, is what I made for my uh, degree show uh, when I finished at Glasgow School of Arts. And uh, yeah, so these are actually photograms uh, scattering my grandfather's ashes onto photographic paper. Uh, and exposed to the lights. Um, and it really started as a way of coming to terms with my experience of uh, losing my grandparents and other family members when I was still quite young. And I realized uh, in my mid twenties when I was uh, studying that I really hadn't come to terms with uh, all of that. And I really sort of turned to photography, um, which had been up until then, I was uh, pursuing a very sort of uh, a documentary career at that time in photography. And yeah, I turned more to photography as a very cathartic process to help me cope with loss and uh, started reading a lot of Roland Barthes and Camera Lucida. And uh, yeah, um, I was always very interested in astronomy and astrology. And ultimately this project was a way of bringing all those uh, feelings and ideas together in, in one project. Um, it actually started as a documentary project way back in 2012 when I was scattering uh, my grandfather's ashes around the coast of Scotland. And I was just sort of documenting this process, uh, just, you know, as photographs, um, as a project. Uh, but over time, I, I personally felt the project didn't quite come together. And I was worried that I was maybe sharing uh, too much. And I sort of put the project to bed for a while and then came back to it after a year. And uh, after having sort of not done anything with the project for a while, uh, I had the idea that maybe I could explore uh, photograms as a way of uh, showing the ashes instead. Um, and I wondered maybe showing the trace was more subtle. And I realized very quickly that if I sketched them, you know, obviously they would look like stars uh, with the black and white. And so, yeah, that all sort of came together from there. Uh, but I was so worried if it was still a very, very personal or two personal projects. And I was, uh, I didn't, I wasn't sort of happy showing it to anyone. It just felt like a very sort of personal thing that I'd keep in a drawer. And um, my tutor at the time at GSA, Andy Stark, was very uh, encouraging and told me, uh, that this could be anyone's grandfather and uh, that the viewer could you know, impart their own, hopefully impart their own emotions into this too. And uh, so that was a sort of turning, one of the turning points for me that I realized uh, uh, that this, this wasn't just a, this maybe wasn't just a personal project and uh, it may have been a universal experience for everyone of loss. And uh, yeah, one of the main lessons I learned from that was that work which you often think is very personal uh, is very often uh, universal. And uh, yeah, I was researching a lot of uh, the earliest photograms, uh, the pencil of nature, uh, William, William Henry Fox Talbot, Man Ray, uh, Arthur Langdon Coburn. Uh, in his book, Shadow Catchers, uh, Martin Barnes associates the, the popularity of the photogram in the early 20th century with the rise of psychoanalysis. Uh, so that was a sort of springboard then for more research into uh, the ideas of sublimation and uh, the ideas of Freud and Jacques Lacan. And uh, the sublime is one of those sort of fascinating ideas uh, in that it takes on so many different meanings for different for everyone. And throughout time, it's taken all, all these different meanings. And uh, sublime could be something beautiful but terrifying in space. Uh, yeah, for Freud, it was the, the idea of an object becoming the focus of sublimation that fills the void left by the beloved, which could be ash, but it could also be a photograph, the photographs we keep of uh, lost loved ones and how that object comes to, to fill that their void. Uh, but it, it also could be, the sublime could be an object which is lost uh, sort of beyond memory. Uh, it could be a unity with the cosmos. In the moment all matter was one, a moment which you somehow remember but can never quite get back to or define. And uh, yes, yeah, so I was trying to explore photography um, as a way of, yeah, how could we re reconnect with this lost unity? 
and that just led to more research. Uh, so sort of one of my main inspirations was Hiroshi Sugimoto, uh, I, who I discovered during a trip to um, the Scottish Gallery of Modern Art in 2011. There was a huge show of his, and uh, that was really, uh, yeah, a sort of life-changing experience for me to discover uh, his, his photography. Uh, these are his lightning fields, and he was using a, a Van de Graaff uh, 400,000 volt generator to apply an electrical charge directly onto film. And uh, yeah, I just, it was only later that I really realized just what an effect that that exhibition had had on my practice. Uh, his other projects are the seascapes, uh, landscape photographs as a way of reconnecting the viewer with a memory of the sea, uh, as in all life emerging from the sea. And uh, he has this beautiful quote here, I just wanted to share. Uh, what I've attempted to show by the medium of photography is an ancient level of human memory, uh, whether individual memory or the collective memory of humanity as a whole. The idea is to go back in time to remember where we came from, how we came to be a sea memory. I'm quite sure that it's a memory of the sea. And um, from there, I was wondering, uh, could you take this to its logical conclusion? Um, do we have a memory of having originated in the stars of the Big Bang? And there's a beautiful quote from Carl Sagan, the astronomer, uh, we are made of star stuff. Uh, so from there, all the ideas sort of kept rolling um, on and on. Um, I'd also been still quite worried though, if how would people realize that the subject matter was uh, my, my grandfather's ashes and uh, without that knowledge, the projects might not have the same meaning. Um, but again, uh, Su <laughs> Sugimoto's work has sort of helped me uh, comes to terms with that in that uh, projects can have surprising endings. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a beautiful quote again of his uh, cinema's project, in which uh, he photographs the entire length of a film over one exposure. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the real meaning of the photograph only becomes clearer when you read, you know, where the theater was or what, which movie he was uh, photographing. And uh, yeah, again, this, I love this quote here. Uh, with the photograph, the medium itself is a parody and that parody has, has a surprise ending that continues uh, to infinity. Um, uh, yeah, so the idea of the surprise ending was a breakthrough in my work. Uh, I had been quite preoccupied with finding a way to convey that the, this was human remains uh, through other pho photographs in the series. Uh, but I also realized that the photos, uh, yeah, I didn't always have to use text. I realized the sort of misrecognition of space, lands uh, space as landscapes, misrecognition of the photographs as space that had meaning, had value too. And the surprise ending of the project being that you are the, the sublime object of space, that you are, uh, you're essentially the same thing as the stars. You've come from the same space that you uh, resemble stars uh, when you pass on. Uh, so I experimented with different scales. Uh, so these are around 70 centimeters high. Uh, but also I made sort of uh, much larger ones after I really looked into the sublime and the idea of the sublime is uh, something quite overwhelming to the senses. Uh, Edmund Burke uh, defined the sublime as the sort of the terror of icy cliffs and mountains and uh, space is sublime because it's threatening, uh, yet when viewed from a distance it becomes very beautiful. And uh, in his introduction to the sublime, uh, by Sir Adam Phillips writes, uh, this choice between creeping and flying announces the dilemma of the sublime. Does it bring us down to earth or link us with the divinity of the skies? Uh, does it enlarge us or diminish us? And uh, yeah, I had this idea of a photograph caught between uh, the earth and the sky. Um, this one was much larger. This was uh, made on a roll of uh, darkroom uh, Ilford paper. Uh, this is about one, one and a half meters wide. And uh, yeah, experimenting with the, the black hole as a sort of the ultimate sublime object, um, sort of, you know, beautiful from afar, but it's uh, any object which comes too close to the black hole uh, will be sucked in. Um, and uh, yeah, so these were experimented with making various masks to mask out the, uh, the section around the black and it's sort of a hole in the, in the mask, which was exposed first. And then I would take the mask off and scatter the ashes on uh, and expose uh, the ashes uh, later and then processed. Um, and uh, yeah, then I progressed to uh, much, much larger uh, scales again. This was about two meters wide. Um, yeah, and I, I was very impressed by Kant's idea of the sublime uh, as this idea that no infinity in space or nature can match the, the sort of infinite scope of the human imagination. And uh, that leads uh, to man's feeling of superiority over nature and nature is under our control. Uh, but I wanted to situate my practice between these two concepts of the sublime sublime which rests in nature 
and the Kantian supply in which the Kate sit in the in the sort of human being as within. And trying to ask this question with my photographs is the is space sublime or uh, does the sublime feeling rest in you? Um, so this was sort of a recreation of the uh, it's called the two mass image of the observable universe. Um, yeah, and the idea that we cannot possibly imagine or, or see or take in all of space in one go, but we can imagine it as an idea. Um, and yeah, I was trying to use photography to convey these ideas. Um, and I'm hoping to uh, present a new edition of this, this print at the uh, Venice Biennale next year at the European Cultural Center. Uh, so hopefully I'm able to show that work again there. And uh, yeah, I think uh, these were just all these sort of ideas that I was exploring. Um, I think the nicest thing that I, uh, the nicest experience that I've had uh, since graduating and exhibiting this work uh, in various spaces was being asked to talk about my own grandfather. And I think several people came up to me and said that, uh, yeah, it made them think of losing their own grandfather. And uh, yeah, even though the research was very personal, um, yeah, I was quite surprised that uh, for some people, the work had had uh, this effect of making them remember their own grandparents. And uh, yeah, I had this yeah, strange experience of letting go of the work after I made it. And uh, it had been a very, very personal time for me to sort of, you know, just uh, we're very alone in the dark room with uh, the paper and my grandfather's ashes, but uh, yeah, letting it go was also very cathartic too because, um, yeah, the response I got from quite a few people was that they'd find it very emotional. And uh, yeah, that was um, a great moment for me that, yeah, it, the work wasn't just personal to me. And uh, yeah, again, these are about one and a half meters wide, uh, these prints here. And yeah, various methods of masking and uh, but all cameraless processes. Uh, the next project I'm going to talk about was uh, one I did in the past year uh, for my master's at the University of Westminster. Um, so this is called The Memory of Deep Blue, and it's another uh, cameraless uh, project I did. Uh, I had originally, for my master's, been going in to look at um, various uses of AI and GANs and algorithms in photography and the rise of deep fakes and what this all means for photographic truth. Uh, so that was my original idea. I wasn't going back in to make another uh, cameraless project. Um, uh, and in the course of my research, I looked at a lot of the history of, uh, yeah, AI versus the human being and the rise of AI and all these sort of great moments in history where AI keeps threatening to take over. And one of them was uh, when Gary Kasparov lost uh, the chess match to the deep blue supercomputer in 1997. And uh, that was seen as a very shocking moment then that a human being would lose to a machine. And I did a lot of research into that, into uh, Kasparov's autobiography, which he goes into a lot of detail of just how ter terrible and emotional that whole experience was of losing to a machine. And of course, nowadays, taken for granted that, of course, you know, of course, a human being, we're always going to lose to the machine because they can think five, five million steps ahead of us. Uh, but the time for this, the, t the time for him, this was still very shocking. And this, uh, I really recommend it. It's a great book. And um, yeah, so I initially thought it would be an AI project. Um, but over time, I, I realized that there was a way to sort of recontextualize uh, this using uh, analog processes. And I could look at, you know, the conflict between uh, AI and the human being and, uh, and yeah, the chess player and the program and the artist and the machine uh, through analog photographic proce processes. Uh, so this is each move of the, the Deep Blue, uh, the final game where Kasparov lost to the machine uh, and trying to retrace every step of the of the computer uh, as it goes and using sort of uh, uh, chess pieces in the dark room uh, to retrace each step. Uh, so I had a sort of, uh, plexiglass sheet that I placed the chess players uh, on, chess pieces on, uh, on a grid and then removed the grid and put a piece of photographic paper uh, underneath. and. Uh, yeah, and you can see the sort of progression. I tried to do a sort of slight progression of the uh, Kasparov species fading to, to black uh, each time as it's slowly losing to the machine. And uh, yeah, there's another, this was recently exhibited in uh, Lithuania. It's part of the Restart Photography Prize in Prospectus Gallery. Um, so yeah, it was great to be able to, to show that there. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, as we're trying to explore these different themes of AI versus analog, the analog brain versus uh, the AI uh, brain through strictly cameraless processes. Um, 
Uh, another project that I did last year for my MA was the Eternal Return. And in this project, I was returning to quite similar themes uh, that I explored in Universal Sym Sympathy, uh, not cameras this time and, and for the first time in years using color. Uh, but I was uh, very drawn to this uh, theory of the black sun when I was doing Universal Sympathy. And I thought, oh, I'm going to come back to that at some point. And this idea of the black sun being this sort of a sort of melancholic uh, feeling of the, the void left by the other and uh, bereavement and mourning as being the sort of the feeling of a dark sun passing overhead. And uh, I wanted to reconnect that to photography and this idea of photographs as a sort of black sun, sort of both darkness and light. Uh, uh, yeah, bringing back both sort of joy and melancholy every time you look at pictures of, of loved ones. Uh, so the project is actually uh, pasting uh, photographs onto my skylight window uh, and just seeing sort of the movement of the sun over during the day and trying to yeah, explore this idea of the photograph as something which sort of, uh, or photographs of lost loved ones as something which sort of blocks out the sun and sort of uh, this constant shadow uh, that photographs uh, possess. Uh, it started out as a sort of follow-on from my projects I did uh, also during my, my BA, which is Man in the Moon. And this is when I was holding negatives to the light of the moon. Uh, so uh, here, these are just held on a, on a glass plate and just watching the moon slowly pass over these negatives. And again, trying to question the idea that you can view the, the life of a human being through the movement of the stars and planets. Uh, and I always wanted to, to return to this at some point and do a project where I was holding positives to the sun. Uh, and I found, yeah, this beautiful quote from uh, the French poet Gerard de Nerval. Uh, Everybody knows one never sees the sun in one's dreams, even though one is aware of, far, like, of a light far more luminous. And again, with the sky, trying to explore dream imagery and mythic imagery in, uh, in the project. And uh, yeah, these were uh, some of the photographs I made for my uh, master's project. And I've sort of explored turning them into a book uh, and I'm sort of making this sort of book dummy uh, in different sizes uh, currently. Um, or in different, uh, yeah, again, mythic imagery and dream imagery of, uh, I guess the, the very personal idea I was trying to share in this uh, was this feeling of being reconnected with lost loved ones and dreams, which I don't know, but uh, it's something I've experienced. And yeah, I feel that's something we've probably all experienced at some time. Uh, and that was something I was very, uh, yeah, concerned with exploring. Uh, could I explore this idea through photography? Uh, so I was very, explored, uh, very influenced by uh, the films of David Lynch and just the, his use of uh, dream imagery in his films. Uh, it comes up again in uh, the film Mulholland Drive, uh, which was a great inspiration uh, for these projects. And uh, yeah, so these were taken over um, many weeks and months, uh, mostly during the summer to get uh, the best lights of just sort of waiting and waiting for, uh, to see how the different clouds would affect the, uh, I guess the, the background light on the photographs. Um, and yeah, this, this is really, it's an ongoing project in that I'm trying to explore this uh, still, but in more abstract ways and just using, uh, you know, blank uh, photographic paper, unexposed photographic paper. And, and now I'm currently exploring layering this uh, on the window, which is a guess, and then re-photographing it there and seeing what different uh, abstract patterns could emerge. Uh, Working for the, the lighter, lighter months here in London to really explore those that as, as a more abstract project. Um, uh, but yeah, sorry, this, <laughs> this more slides than I thought it was, but uh, those were some of my recent projects uh, uh, that I wanted to share. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions after, uh, along with Liz, after we've both spoken. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for, for listening. And um, there's more work on the website there. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing it. That was great. As I'm talking to you, there's a lot of connections between our ideas. I, I have a background in philosophy. That's my undergraduate degree. And I'm constantly questioning the meaning of life and the way you present your work is so poetic. And um, anyway, so it's, I feel like there's a, there's a conversation that, that will be happening, but your work is amazing. And thank you for sharing it. Definitely, thank you very much. Um, Liz, do you want to uh, present your work? Yes, so I'm gonna share my screen. Thanks. 
and uh, tell me if you see you see it and and you can see me yeah we can yes. see okay. both yourself and the screen that's perfect okay super okay so um i'm gonna go through a few different projects but um first i'm starting with this because it's the newest material that i'm working on which i'm really excited about um and it's uh called fuji clear so it's um it's like usually commercially used i guess but it's um light sensitive and it's like a plastic and then i face mounted it and i'm i'm quite interested in how uh, an image can project itself onto the wall, especially just these are the moments that we see like in our bedroom and um, or just like on the train or something. And uh, they're just fleeting, but I'm trying to capture them in this way. So um, this one is called the curtain of consciousness. Um, and then these are some more of on that same material. I'm gonna go kind of, sometimes I'll stop, but I'm gonna go kind of quick because I have several slides to present. Um, so this clear material is kind of like stained glass. Um, and then I, I'm starting also, uh, this is where I was at the beginning of the lockdown. I was doing an artist residency at the McCall Center and I had this gorgeous studio and, uh, and then the residency <laughs> got closed. I actually left to go to Doha to do a presentation um, there in Qatar and teach the students that are at the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in the Qatar campus. So the bottom picture is all those black and whites. That was my workshop that I taught the class. And then while I was there, the campus got closed down and the show never actually opened. So there we are in the show, but that's all of who was there. And uh, here's an image that I uh, connects to that same work that was shown in London. I know many of the participants here today are in London. So I wanted to present this. I show with a gallery there called Black Box, which uh, now is going to be more cur currently located in Cromwell Place, but prior to this had a lot of pop-up locations. So they would do the show popped up just based upon the artwork that was there. Um, all of these are large scale photograms um, or may, not all of them are large scale, but many are large. And uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating the work directly on top of the paper. So there's a one-to-one -one contact with the paper. Um, and if, if it's paper at all, this is, this is called Fuji Flex. So it's a polyester based material, but it's got a dye sublimation in it, similar to what the former Chrome papers had like Ilford. Um, and I know I'm talking to a bunch of photographers, so probably people already know this, but I like to present it anyway, because sometimes people um, are unaware of the uh, way that the light wheel works versus the color wheel. Um, so I just present it like just opposite. So, you know, red and green are opposite in pigment, but in light it's magenta and green and, uh, and blue and yellow versus blue and orange. So you're always combining the lights together. So when you're working with the enlarger in the color dark room, uh, you're mixing three colors, which are the magenta, the yellow and the cyan. And when you mix the colors together, like everything that I'm thinking about is always an opposite. So if I want to mix red and green together, the color I get is yellow instead of brown. Um, and then on the paper, yellow gives you the blue. Maybe this is maybe this is common knowledge, but sometimes people um, are happy that I showed them this because it's you're there's just a lot of math involved, and I'm I'm literally like counting the wavelengths when I'm creating the work. So there's a lot of um, it's almost like playing music, like I've been figuring out how to do it. So like when you see certain colors on the paper, um, then the opposite color was what was projected onto the paper. I do a lot of landscapes, um, a lot of abstract, uh, abstract landscapes. Um, a lot of times I'm, my intention is for the landscape to be viewed from mutable point of view. So it, you're not necessarily standing in a fixed location. You could view the landscape from many different sides. Um, and also I, I'm interested in not only quantum physics because of light and landing light and particles um, onto the paper, but also the idea of double viewpoints. So almost like the computing thing with uh, that Alan was talking about with chess, like being able to think like 5,000 moves in front of the other thing. Um, a lot of times you, you come to an image and you see one thing one time and then you see another thing another time. So the landscapes are 
they're, they're fused. They're more than one place. Um, and then they exist in no place. And, uh, but they evoke memories of some place. And uh, they could be fusions of places I've been um, or places I've visited in my mind or um, places I've just researched online. And each part of the image is exposed separately. So there's many different uh, exposures inside everything. There's, I usually start with a drawing. Um, I do many different sketches and then I have a, a complex like layering system where I can uh, mask off certain parts and expose certain parts at each time to create the light. So there's so in a way they're like light paintings. People constantly ask me, am I looking at a photograph? Is this photography? Um, my answer is yes. Of course, it's a very pure form of photography. I'm recording light onto paper, which is the actual definition of photography. So yes, um, it is, but it's uh, it's it's kind of, I mean, Alan also is doing photograms. It's like one of the oldest forms of photography, yet it's just being done in a more contemporary way. Um, and a lot of the titles are uh, also connected to like to connect connected to life and um, love and death. This one is actually called "I Like to Imagine You're in a Place Like This." So it is like the idea of um, losing someone and wondering where they are and hoping that it's somewhere just beyond beautiful and uh, exquisite. Um, this one is called "The Window Landscape." Um, I also see this one as a casket. <laughs> so it has a, um, it's like, it's a landscape, but, and you can see it that, that way, but then through a window, but then you can also return to it and you can almost see somebody laying um, horizontally on the top of it um, in a casket. And maybe you see something else, of course, abstraction lends itself to this, that you can, you can see what you wanna see. But I like the idea that you would return to a work and see it differently another time or with whatever perspective you're holding within you at that time and so it becomes relative um then this is another one this is another landscape um an overlapping landscape um and i i like thinking about the idea that time um exists on top of itself so something from the past is still existing um with an imprint in the future only in energy that you can't see something invisible. And so um, this would almost be like the idea of the any landscape that you ever photograph is would change, you know, from millions of years into the into the future or past and be all mixing on top of itself. So there's a lot of these um, landscapes that fuse, they move their they orbit um, the, their shapes start to orbit around um, like a moon could be in one position one time and then in a million years and another time, but all of it sitting on top of itself. And sometimes they connect. This one is um, a landscape and also a portrait um, and then landscape and portrait also. It's in, sometimes they fuse together in terms of the, the shapes. Another orbiting landscape. So they're also, sometimes I, immer I make them very um, emerging out of blackness um, with sharper lines or uh, more painterly. And this is just depending on like what materials I'm putting on top of the paper and like how I'm exposing the light um, and with, with or without movement too. Sometimes I'll, things like this I'll be exposing, but in a still manner, um, whereas some of the images have movement while I'm even exposing them like this. This is the space station. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look like it, but you, that's what I call it. This one's called Cuddling With You. And I'm also really interested in rocks and I've gotten into these stone stacks, which I've put some of them into. This is called Glacier Cruising. Um, and this, this is one of the mountains. So this one's called the Red Mountains, but this mountain comes into a group of um, a triptych where, um, I started to create these infrastructures that the base layers of some of the um, photogram like um, parts that I'm putting on top of the pieces are the same. And I'm and then I'm exposing all the other parts of it separately. And the reason that I was doing that is I'm interested in entanglement um, and the idea that once two particles are connected, they're always connected and no matter the distance or the time. 
um, Einstein used to call this spooky action at a distance. And um, sometimes uh, an entangled partner gets a third entangled partner. And I'm really interested in this idea of entanglement. Like I can, it continues to come back to my work. Like in fact, my next show, which I'll present at the very end is called spooky action, which is based on entanglement. So the, the way that light behaves and the way that particles behave and things that are faster than the speed of light or seem to behave in an uncanny way, um, which is unexplainable and quantum and connected in my mind to consciousness. Uh, so I have like the rainbows and this one's called the aura. So it's like the emanating light. And some of these are, um, you know, there's, they're directly done on top of the papers. So they're like light drawings. There's a there's a another one on the other side that looks like it's just pure light too. That one's called acceptance. So this one connects to this one, which is the opposite. So those are an entangled pair. The idea with the entangled pairs too is that they're diptychs in a sense, but they will never um, remain together. So like I actually have the intention that they will never be sold together. Um, and they so they must connect two separate people. And, and sometimes I'll even keep one. So I'm connected to that other one through entanglement, through the particles that were connected in the creation of the piece. This is the acceptance piece. And then the Toros, um, I did a lot of the stone stacks and stone arches. I was doing them for quite some time. I kind of stopped. Maybe I'll return to them at some point, but um, they're the idea of getting a quantum leap, a creative breakthrough, like a, um, a movement in consciousness that makes you feel like you're walking through broader steps on earth. And, um, and so they're just like these things that we all long for to like pass through these moments. Um, this one's called the ghost stone arch because the, the stone that's in the middle is almost a ghost. It's very, barely visible. You might be able to see on your screen, there's a tiny bit of purple. But a lot of times the thing that holds everything together is something that's invisible. Some of them are really large. This one's like, I'm, I have a hard time with centimeters, but um, one, it's like, this one is like 200 and uh, maybe 60 centimeters. It's really large, tall and wide. I can't hang it even in my studio. <laughs> Um, and then this one is a group seance, so it's an arch on the side where the where the thing that connects the rest of the circle is not in the frame. And I, I'm interested in the idea of what is outside the frame anyway, what you present inside the frame, what you what what what's outside the photographic frame when you take a picture too. How's my time? I have like six more minutes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I just want to be. Um, respectful because <laughs> I have a lot I go I go I want to go fast um oh, so these yeah. are also the Toro yeah this one is actually I created this right before the lockdown which is funny because I just called it friends and um and I think about it now it's like <laughs> that was not social distancing <laughs> it's like if our friends are all that close together um, but so, yeah so here's some drawings um, that I did to create the totem so like I start in my sketchbook and then I'll move into these um, totemic pieces that I created, which are kind of like beans, um, but also totems. They connect to like all the ancient shapes of circle, square, triangle, um, which are also contemporary, just classical shapes that exist. Um, and I've been on this, these totem themes in different directions for quite some time. Okay, so here are some black and whites, which I did during lockdown and I'm still working on them. I'm actually going, to the dark room tomorrow again. Um, but I got kind of back into, into the black and whites because I couldn't go into my color lab. So technically I exposed my ex color prints in my studio in the dark, and then I put them in a light safe tube and I drive them to whatever lab I can use to do the chemicals in. So I'm doing all the wet part, not in my studio. And the black and white studio is the only one I could get into. So I, <laughs> during that time, cause you can go in there alone. And, uh, and so I kind of went back into black and whites and I've been working on these landscapes. I don't know where I'm going to show them yet or when, but, um, but I'm really into them. And uh, I created this really nice, like light um, 
I think it's nice. It's like a liquid, liquid feel to a lot of them. Some of them are that, that are all gray tones, um, no blacks and no whites. And then I also have ones that are just only black and only white, which come out next. So that it's sort of that same thing with the painterly feel versus like a, um, versus like a very graphic feel. This is my favorite one. I feel like it has a curtain in front of it. So then these are the very graphic looking ones. And this is what I actually started doing in the beginning of lockdown because I couldn't get into my studio even. And um, so I stuck at my kitchen table. Um, and so I started to make paper negatives. So these are like really just like one exposure um, of a black and a white onto the silver gelatin. And then I started moving, moving the light around. So I ended up getting more painterly looks to some of them too. Very much paper cutout negative. There's, they range in size. A lot of them are small, um, but some are medium and then some, some of them are larger. And then I put them in my database. I just put this in there because people sometimes ask me how I organize all my artwork. I put it in a database <laughs> um, just to keep track of things, especially so somebody at, if somebody asks me for something, I know where it is in my studio. And, um, and then I put in these because they're contact sheets that I've been shooting. My favorite thing to shoot is the, is the sidewalk and um, I can do so much with it. So I've been photographing the sidewalk, but obviously then I, I shot them in negative. I re-photographed them as slides. And then I, then I messed with them on top of the negatives and then I printed them in color. <laughs> so this is like the layers of it, but sometimes you can see that what I'm shooting versus like what I'm creating. Sometimes it's just exact. Um, and then this is how I started my moon series, just circles like in the world. Um, but the moons are based on a collapsing universe. So instead of the big bang, it would be the big crunch, which is part of the big bounce. And, um, and everything would start to eclipse itself. And I'm, I've turned these now into tethers. Um, so anytime somebody is born or passes away, I, um, that I'm close to, I usually give them a moon with the name of that person on it, because that person is going to orbit them, whether in life or after life. This one called the time orbiter. Um, a lot of bright colors, the four seasons. Okay, I, I feel like I should stop because I I think I, I can't tell how many more pictures I have, but I think it's like 15. <laughs> or maybe I'll just move through them and we'll look and then we'll talk. Okay. I don't That's want to go at the end. Oh, inspiration. <laughs> really nice. These are entangled, some of these are entangled pairs. So you can see the base structure being connected. And then some have a negative actually in them. So one projection from the enlarger, these are the painted pots at Yellowstone Park. They have geothermal activity. So they're hot spots on earth um, that I'm interested in. Okay, this is the end. This is my next show. You get the sneak peek. Um, it's going to be in a church and it's all of the ones coming off the wall. They're mocked up. They don't really look like that yet, but they're, they're the clears. So they're going to project onto the walls. And then that's the last piece. It's a swan. It's a boat. It's a landscape. It's, it's a few things. Thank you. Thank you so much for being so generous and sharing so much. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you both for being so generous and explaining in detail um, your practices. That's been so enriching. Um, if anyone in the room uh, wants to unmute yourself to, well, I, I guess you guys can see the messages. So there's a lot of people um, congratulating you for your wonderful work. But also, if anyone wants to unmute themselves to um, ask a direct question, please feel free to do so. I think um, everyone is allowed to unmute themselves. So I'm just trying to go through the questions to see if I have missed one. But um, 
It's mainly. Are these prints smaller photograms or actual photograms? Um, is that to me? Yes, I from Milen uh, Milena. I, I don't know if you can see the chat, Liz. Can you see the chat? <laughs> Um, yes, they okay. They are actual photographs. They're not prints of photographs. Just um, one, one offs of photographs. So they're photograph. Those are photographs of the photogram, I guess, because I document the photograms. But so that's how you're seeing it. But yeah, just a one to one. Great. So there's a question for Liz. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the Fuji Clear material. I have never heard of this before. Do you create this in the same way as a photogram? Well, that was already answered, but mainly about Fuji, uh, Fuji crystal material. Yeah. Yeah. So the Fuji Clear material is, um, I mean, it's more commercially used, but it actually, I do it just like I do a regular photogram. Um, it's actually a little less sensitive to light. So I have to. I, you have to plan, you always have to be thinking about which material you're using. So it's, it, I can give it a lot more light, but that means I also have to plan for how I'm giving it the light because in order to, I have to um, plan for more light in all different ways. Um, but it's just, it's a little bit thicker. It's, um, I guess it's close to like what used to be the Duratrans material, um, but it's just really clear. I mean, it's sensitive on one side, the same, the same way the, um, the flex is, but I don't, in the dark, it looks like film. I mean, I say it looks like meaning. I have a, I have a question. Um, so I'm currently doing, um, a foundation year at, at UAL in photography and, uh, for like my current project, I'm um, like trying to explore the idea of like coming to terms with my existence and um, using the intangibility of light to explore that and try and visualize that. Um, and I was just wondering, um, and this is for both of you, like um, with these sort of experimental processes, how do you, you know, kind of um, continue to explore these very like uh incomprehensible ideas and try to make them visual and like you know through these experimentations if that makes sense <laughs> alan you want to take it <laughs> it's, uh, hard. it's hard yeah um I, I guess uh i can only sort of uh relate that to my own practice uh but i think in uh in my practice the sort of revelation i had was of the, the subjects are all, when, when, do, when do subjects become objects and when do objects become subjects was a big question for me in terms of uh, the sort of ex existential question and at which point does So yeah, that was certainly on my mind a lot too. And uh, I actually looked a lot into uh, language theory as to the language linguist theorist called uh, David Baum. And uh, he had a lot to say about you know how we how language separates separates us basically, and sort of categorizes everything. And how how do we return to this idea that we are all whole? And that was this constant uh, yeah interest for me of trying to use photography as a way to reconnect this idea of wholeness uh, and this idea that yes everything all matter is the same, and that actually what differences are really between you and a photograph. And yeah, and as a photograph actually uh, yeah. I, I got sort of quite lost in those questions when I was doing my uh, BA uh, as to yeah what yeah what is the difference between me and a photograph and yeah going quite crazy probably at one time but uh, uh, so yeah I um, and uh, yeah I guess that's I guess the idea that I rested on was that subjects and objects are in one sort of constant continuum and subjects are constantly becoming objects and we you know we end up as an object uh, and everything's transitory. Um, um, I don't think I quite answered your question, but uh, yeah, I, I understand that, you know, uh, it's a wonderful time to, if you're at UAL just now, that's just to explore all these questions and get, you know, completely lost. Uh, I'm not sure if I left with any answers, but uh, <laughs> but the, the process in itself is, um, yeah, 
Um, Alan, there is a, um, so Camille is asking in the chat if you would mind to type the name of the linguist. Um, so uh, she Just can double check that. Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, and there is another question for Liz, which is Does Fuji clear process in the same way? Oh, um, yeah, actually it does. However, you not only does it need more light, but you have to slow down the process time. Um, so it just takes like, it takes longer. Like I think the developing time is um, maybe two and a half times the regular developing time for another piece of paper, but also, um, but it still goes through the developer stop, um, fix, bleach, all that stuff, just the same. And then it also dries slower. So like when you, when you're drying it, it'll be like really sticky. <laughs> um longer so uh like a heat gun is helpful great thank you okay i think i'm not missing any questions uh, i see there's a question there's uh melena asks me uh if my grandfather knew that i was going to make that project um, and the answer is no. Uh, he died uh, uh, sadly before my interest in photography took over. Um, but I, I did ask uh, my parents, my mother, uh, who was the daughter of my grandfather. Uh, you know, I explained to her the projects, and she sort of gave it her blessing. And uh, I don't think she quite understood what photograms were uh, until she saw them. And yeah, um, but I, I did explain to her what the project would look like and what it would be, and if this was okay with her, and said yes. Um, uh, several people have asked me what my grandfather thought of the projects, and uh, he had this sort of very uh, bleak, black sense of humor. And honestly, uh, and I've asked my mom this too, and we both agreed if he saw them, he probably would have laughed uh, just because he had a sort of very wise sense of humor. Um, and obviously, I, I can't say what he would have thought on it, but uh, yeah, if I genuinely thought, if I thought he would have had any problems with it, I wouldn't have done it. And uh, yeah, that's the best answer I can give. Thank you. Alan, it's, it's been lovely presenting with you, Alan. I think you too, it's a real honor. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a conversation we should continue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you both for presenting your work and uh, answering all of these questions. And um, oh, seems to be one more or um, maybe it's, no, seems to be okay. In any case, also feel free to contact the participants directly if after this talk you have more questions um, that you'd like to um, ask them. Um, maybe you guys can type your um, Instagram details so people know your handles and they can uh, follow you and reach you if they want to get to know a little bit more about your practice um, that we are not covering today. Brilliant. Thank you both. And uh, yeah, hope to um, hear more about your project soon. Good luck with your practice. Thanks. Thank you, Almu, for inviting us. My pleasure. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.